Raised in violence, I enacted my own violence upon the world and myself. What saved me was the camera, its ability to gaze upon, to focus, to investigate, to reclaim, to resist, to re-envision. I'm pleased to welcome you to this artist interview series, which is in conjunction with the exhibition Prison Nation at the Davis Museum at Wellesley College. Prison Nation is organized by the Aperture Foundation New York. Nicole R. Fleetwood and Michael Famagetti are the curators. Aperture's Prison Nation exhibition was made possible by lead support from the Ford Foundation, and additional generous support was provided by the Reva Judith Sandler Foundation. In today's interview, we will learn more about the work of documentary photographer, Joseph Rodriguez. Hello, my name is Joseph Rodriguez. I've been a documentary photographer for over 30 years, and I'm interested in, in the human condition. And um, photography for me is much more personal than just a professional practice. So um, yeah, I, I Sorry, I'm just kind of stuck here for more explanation, but it really, I, I photograph from my heart and, and a lot of stories that have been told to me and shared to me throughout my own community here in Brooklyn, New York and families and just, yeah. So it's really about the people in front of the camera, not about the photographer. And that I sort of, started with my first introduction as a teenager here in New York City. I saw a show by Jakob Ries and, and I became very interested in his practice. Didn't know much about photography at the age of 14, 15, but I learned that he was a social worker and uh, someone, a, a religious, a, a Protestant, person in New York City who, who was very um, moved by how we were living at that time. And, you know, the housing was pretty bad and what all the issues that, all the social issues that were happening at the time. But mainly he went into these apartment buildings on his own and did all of this research. And then the camera was introduced and then he used the camera to kind of document that evidence. The next photographer who really sort of enlightens me as now 16 years old would be Lewis Hein and sort of how he went about photographing in, in this city and other cities as well. And um, just taking the time to help the other and being raised Catholic, I guess that was also <laughs> instilled in, in this young man. And so I wanted to tell those kinds of stories. And I would just say that, you know, as a teenager, I, I had my own um, run-ins with uh, the criminal justice system. Um, my home was fractured. My stepfather was in and out of prison um, as a heroin addict and mom was, we were struggling for money. And it was, it was just a very tough situation. Stories you hear about, they're very common today, but, um, I held all of that in until I was able to sort of stand up on my own two feet. But it, I lost about 10 years of my life from 17 to 26 as a heroin addict going in and out of Rikers Island two times, uh, being sexually assaulted inside, inside of uh, Rikers Island, um, being stuck in with older men. I was 17 years old at that time. And that is, that is a driving force within Joseph Rodriguez, that, that experience and my family upbringing and, and our other siblings um, and what we had to sort of grow up with. Um, when I became educated in photography much later on, when I was about 35, I changed careers from the graphic arts industry and, and went to the International Center of Photography and it gave me a scholarship, being the only Puerto Rican in New York to get a scholarship to study documentary photography under 
uh, Fred Richin and uh, Cornell Kappa. And so that was the beginning of the journey, folks, for me, and started looking at my own community called Spanish Harlem and worked on that for five years, talking to a lot of families and trying to sort of understand what really happens at, and, and this is kind of an old American expression, but how, what happens at the kitchen table? And that's where a lot of my stories begin. And the mothers, very, very interested in the mothers. I always had been because I watched my mom and my aunts go through all of these struggles. And so, and as a child listening to them talk as sister to sister, you know, at the kitchen table, we lived in these small tenement apartments so you could hear everything, right? So, and uh, I just, I guess I kind of, a lot of those stories from them were kind of instilled in me. And there was a lot of trauma involved in our upbringing, but those stories stayed with me for almost 30 years before I can bring them out. And so you're seeing some of that within this reentry work in California. My name is Vanessa Lee. I'm the co-executive um, co -executive director and co-founder of Sisters Unchained. We are um, an organization based out of Boston, Massachusetts that works directly with young women who are affected by parental incarceration. Um, we're about eight and a half years old <laughs> at this point. Um, and if what brought me to this work um, I don't, I, I never had a parent in prison, but I did get in trouble a lot in high school. And, um, you know, when you're at least in Boston at that time, I can only speak about that time. Um, so the long time ago, um, it, public high schools were just not, and I don't know if they still are, but at that, during that time there, they weren't, they didn't really cater to students who had issues, um, especially things going on at home. Um, and once you got in trouble or you got suspended, um, you know, that was it, you were marked, you know, there was nobody was going to help you, nobody was going to take time or interest in you. Um, and our school was very heavily policed, so we would get searched um, upon arrival, there was always at least five or six motorcycle um, police motorcycles outside in the beginning of school at the end of school they were walking through the hallways, and um, it was it was hard. And I got arrested a lot. Um, I think what really um, put me in a really bad position was when my uncle called the police on me at home once when there was an altercation because they already, you know, my family was done with me. They thought that I was one of those kids and I wasn't going to achieve to anything. And then I went into DYS custody for a little bit. And, I, and that was, again, I spiraled a little bit more every time I'd go to school, I'd get in trouble or I'd get arrested or get suspended. Sometimes they wouldn't let you in if you were late. So you had to just go, you know, and go, where do you go? And, you know, your family's not really all that supportive. Um, I am Peruvian. I was born in Lima and I'm an immigrant. I arrived in Jamaica Plain when I was four. And, um, yeah, it was, it was tough, you know, when you're immigrants, you, your parents work all the time um, in your home with whoever can stay home with you. Um, there was a lot of um, abuse that they weren't, um, privy to, and I, my mother and I didn't really have the best um, relationship, and she um, wasn't in my life very, and when she was, it wasn't a very positive um, experience, so all of those things, being an adult and a mother, a single mother um, at this moment, um, it just, I, it was so organic for um, Sisters Unchained to happen, for it to, for us to create the space that can offer um, support to young women and a lot of them you know, every time they tell a story I it's so I can relate <laughs> you know, I could relate to like 90 percent unfortunately of the things that they've gone through um, so I hope to um, continue this work and I hope that um, everybody people in different parts of the world and different parts of the country understand what incarceration um, does to not just the person you're incarcerating, but also to the families and the daughters and the sons and everybody that they leave behind. First of all, I want to thank you all so much for taking the time to be a part of this video series and already um, opening up and being so vulnerable with us. I think that's um, going to be a huge um, 
impact, I think, in these videos, I think that will make a huge difference. Um, so in terms of who I am, um, my name is Aiko, and I'm a current senior at Wellesley um, studying sociology and Latin American studies. Um, I'm currently conducting independent research within the sociology department on nonprofit organizations in Massachusetts that aid mothers and children affected by the criminal legal system. And I'm specifically working with and interviewing employees who work in the Young Mothers Program at ROCA, which is a Massachusetts-based organization that aims to disrupt the cycles of incarceration, poverty, and racism. And I also have in the past work, um, worked with my local chapter of the Innocence Center um, in Salt Lake City, Utah, which aims to overturn wrongful convictions. Um, and so this work that I've done is something that I am interested in pursuing myself. As a teenager, I, I had my own uh, run-ins with uh, the criminal justice system. Um, my home was fractured. My stepfather was in and out of prison um, as a heroin addict and mom was, we were struggling for money and it was, it was just a very tough situation. Stories you hear about, they're very common today, but, um, I held all of that in until I was able to sort of stand up on my own two feet, but it, I lost about 10 years of my life from 17 to 26 as a heroin addict going in and out of Rikers Island two times, uh, being sexually assaulted inside, inside of uh, Rikers Island, um, being stuck in with older men. I was 17 years old at that time. And that is, that is the driving force within Joseph Rodriguez. That, that experience and my family upbringing and, and our other siblings um, and what we had to sort of grow up with um, when I became educated in photography much later on, when I was about 35, I changed careers from the graphic arts industry and, and went to the International Center of Photography and it gave me a scholarship, being the only Puerto Rican in New York to get a scholarship to study documentary photography under uh, Fred Richin and uh, Cornell Kappa. And so that was the beginning of the journey folks for me and started looking at my own community called Spanish Harlem. And, Worked on that for five years, talking to a lot of families and trying to sort of understand what really happens at, and this is kind of an old American expression, but how, what happens at the kitchen table? And that's where a lot of my stories begin. And the mothers, very, very interested in the mothers. I always had them because I watched my mom and my aunts go to all of these struggles. And so, and as a child listening to them talk as sister to sister, you know, at the kitchen table, we lived in these small tenement apartments so you could hear everything, right? So, and uh, I just, I guess I kind of, a lot of those stories from them were kind of instilled in me. And there was a lot of trauma involved in our upbringing, but those stories stayed with me for almost 30 years before I can bring them out. And so you're seeing some of that within this reentry work in California. What was fantastic about this particular facility, because um, there was a lot of money being spent in California at the time to change the rules, so to speak. You know, a lot of these are drug crimes that a lot of these women have and men have. And, you know, rightfully so, they, they it'll cost us less money. First of all, it's always, it was kind of an economic <laughs> sort of looking at what incarceration costs in California and, uh, and what it costs throughout the country in different states. Folks came up with some ideas about, well, maybe these are the less violent, the less problematic. But as we all know, that when, you, when your family gets caught up in the system or if they're already having problems at home and there's drugs involved and alcohol involved and abuse involved, you know, now we have to try to help that parent who's hopefully coming out mm -hmm. to try to give them the tools and the knowledge about how to make things better. Right? Mm -hmm. I used to hear this a lot. Women would always say, I want to, I want to, I want to reconnect with my kids and the kids would come. And I mean, there's a, there's 300 photographs from this 
these five or six that you're seeing um, where, you know, that's why I like the documentary practice because you need time to tell a full story, but <laughs> you have the, the children who were left and they feel might've felt abandoned or whatever. And, and in this particular culture and subcultures in California, there are a lot of gangs. I mean, the, the, the gang phenomenon is, is, that's where it all kind of began, so to speak, in terms of this network that's so large now all over the country. And, you know, the kids are growing up, they're in junior high school, they're a little bit like some of us who were troubled in, in our own schools. And then, you know, who's my mom? How do I connect? And so there's a lot of programming that goes on in FOTEP, tons. For, for example, they, they invite the fathers to come in. So the little fathers that are out there, they would come in and then the mother would be sitting next to both of them and they would be parenting classes and anger management classes, cooking. I mean, all kinds of basic, you know, things that you and I as parents and as providers that would normally give our, our families, but they'll learn, they're starting from the bottom to try Because first they have addiction problems and then mental health problems. It's much more complicated today for the average person in the, in the United States to understand really what happens to an individual when you get caught up. Vanessa, you suggested that we look at this image together. What question did you have? Well, I, I just wanted to know more about the image about this person. Um, like when you, um, when you go in to photograph, how did it start? <laughs> like when you, what, and you, when you approached her and you spoke to her, like what did she share or what was her? Well, I mean, the way it starts is first, you know, there's, there's, there's many levels. I mean, you, you yeah. folks know how the criminal justice system mm -hmm. works. So it wasn't like I walked in the door and I could just say, hi, what? Mm -hmm. I had to make a presentation to, I don't know, there must be 60 women mm -hmm. in this one group setting. And, you know, it's a kind of 12 step sort of idea, uh, 12 step uh, structure, so to speak, where people come up and tell their stories, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was introduced. All right. Here's a photographer who's been photographing the male section, the, the male part of, of, of uh, Walden House, and, uh, which is a re-entry program, and um, why I'm here. So I had to explain who I, who I was and why I'm here. And so now all of the women see me. Any woman that is interested in talking with me can raise their hand because everybody had to get a model release. Right. So this was not just some quick snap. Now, what's really interesting, how do we get here is, you know, the day is already in. I'm interviewing many different women um, and getting their stories. And what's going on here? If you look at her eyes, you'll mm -hmm. see the mother's eyes, you'll see how they're looking down a little bit. Right. And how the baby is kind of like open arms. I mean, she's reconnecting. There is a daycare center within FOTEP, which is quite remarkable. And I know about daycare very well because I lived in Stockholm in Sweden and my kids are there now. And I was a part of that whole being a parent in a daycare situation. So, but this particular um, situation is really about women that have not been able to connect with their kids in a long time. So they're teaching them and it's not just mothers of their own children. There are women in there that don't even have children. Mm -hmm. So they go and they help someone else's child, but it's in a daycare setting where you're putting the kids to sleep and you're actually feeding them and playing with them. And so there's a real plan here about mm -hmm. connecting mothers and their children back together. And it's a process because the child has not been with the mother for a while. Right. And she's a little awkward. She's dealing with her own addiction issues. And so but she's brave enough to say, I'm going to go forward and I'm trying. So that was pretty much there wasn't really much of a conversation beyond, you know, this. I'm with my child now because there are a lot of women. You, you don't see it, but there are about 50 people sure. behind me wanting sure. to get to tell their story as well. So. I'm sure. When you look at these photos, like what, what do you feel now? Like when you're, 
when you're as you're talking to us like what when you look at this image what do you what do you feel i feel myself as a child i feel many of the children I mean, if you look at my Instagram right now, I have an Instagram account and I'm putting up an, a, a story that I did about a Los Angeles probation officer and following the different people coming out and what they have to do. The challenges are humongous. So this is an emotional picture for me. So, I mean, she's represented of many women that I know. And so I, I and I, what I love about it is, is the child has got the arms open, right? Mm -hmm almost inviting us, the viewer, into, into their lives, right? To kind of try to understand that. But there's so many different things that happen to a young mother along the way. And, you know, if you're not lucky enough to have the support or the assets that, that many of the families that I live here in Park Slope, Brooklyn, which is a very different community <laughs> compared to where a lot of the women come from. So, but... Um, um, there's emotion there and, and you know, sometimes as, as, as a documentarian, I have to try to think about how to get the viewer to have some empathy, all right? And so, yeah, I don't know. Sometimes I, I've been told I'm more like a parental photographer, <laughs> a social worker with a camera, you know, but it's just, it's just part of who they are. That's, that's what's up. Because, you know, I, mean, I got history with photographing women in prison. I mean, I photographed Bedford Hills Women's Facility here in New York, where they would, it's probably the only facility where they do have a daycare center inside the prison. And then, and then you know, you have to, I think that you can stay two years with your baby. And then after that, the baby leaves and goes with the family until you're able to come out. And, but there's a lot of great work that they're doing in, up in Bedford Hills here in New York. So, but that was way back. I did that for Marie Claire, actually, fashion magazine. Um, so, you know, we publish the work when we can, and then we talk about it and exhibit and, and here we are talking about it again. So, um, which this story just keeps going. Thank you. I was looking at, uh, you sort of mentioned the gaze of the child and the open arms and sort of like, you know, opening up the viewer and things like that. And, but I was looking at that in contrast with the mother, um, mm -hmm. who's looking down, um, mm -hmm. holding the child, um, closed off. I was wondering if you had any sort of ideas of, about what that might mean or anything like that. Mm. Well, I mean, I think it's also, you know, I would think if I were her, right, and I've been in a situation, not necessarily like this, but in a situation when I was in, in jail, you know, I, every time I would talk about it, I would never look anybody in the eye. So, and, you know, if you have addiction issues like I have, you know, there's another emotional sort of wall you have to sort of cross over. Um, you know, I, I, I'm an ex-heroin addict, so I know addiction very well. And I was on methadone for like almost five years. And then I finally quit on my own. Uh, the doctors didn't want me to come down. Uh, off this medicine, which is, you know, what they try to do, um, thinking that I was definitely going to be one of those guys that were always going to have to be there. But I was about changing my life and educating myself. And so that's the reason why I went that way. But I just would share this with you. Getting off of opioids, getting off of alcohol or any kind of drug is not that difficult to do physically. Physically. You do the treatment for a month or two or whatever, and you physically get stronger. It's really the mental state. And I think she's in that mental state right now where she's trying to help and get herself together. But, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a story within this, within this series about Darlene Escalante. Darlene Escalante is one of the women, right? And she's trying to get her children back. And I'm following her now, still, to this day. She's changed her life. I'm just so damn proud of her. She's great. And, and so I think... You know, that's another conversation. But I think when we, we look at this, this, this mother and her child, it was just, Darlene was just exactly the same. Like, ashamed, didn't know how to do it. I, I, I need the tools, you know, and then you don't feel strong enough to kind of look me in the eye. Again. So I have to be sensitive to her. Mm -hmm. But it's really more about her child that we were focusing on in this portrait. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Aiko, you uh, requested uh, to ask a question about uh, this powerful image. So I chose this photo for a few different reasons. Um, first, I chose it because it depicted a child. And in my independent research, I'm particularly interested in how children with incarcerated or formerly incarcerated parents are affected by the criminal legal system, especially because that's often, as um, Vanessa and Joseph, you were both talking about earlier, um, you know, children, relatives, things like that are often not looked at. And we look at the um, per individual who is incarcerated, sort of just looking at them and not looking at how that affects family, community members, things like that. Um, so I, I chose that this photo because of that, but I also chose it um, because its framing and setup stood out to me in comparison to the other photos you took. Um, almost all the other portraits that you took for the series are close-ups of people without anything, whether that be building, object, et cetera, sort of um, in front of the person. But in this image, the photo of the young child is taken from further back and behind a door. Um, and I was wondering if that was an artistic choice um, and why you decided to frame the photograph this way. Well, on the other side of that door is the daycare center. So I had just left the daycare center and she was like looking at me and she's like, hey, hi, bye. And so I just, you know, turned and quickly took this photograph. Um, but it, it moves me when I'm looking at it again. Um, it cause it just says a lot of things. Where's, where's my mom? What did you do to her? Where did she go? When is she coming home? Can we hug each other? I mean, a lot of things. I'm a father of, of two daughters. So, you know, they're grown up now, grandparent now. But, you know, it's it's kind of like when you leave your child mm -hmm. at a daycare center, like a normal, normal mother leaves child at daycare center. You know, when they start to get emotional and start crying and then, you know, we might say, hey, you should go and spend a couple hours with them to kind of feel, make them feel safe. There's trauma in children. I mean, trauma is, is one of the biggest, I'm, I'm, I'm applying for a grant now so I can go in and photograph up in Sing Sing um, about men aging out, meaning the lifers, so to speak, and what they have to look forward to. And one thing I've learned about, you know, a lot of the men that I've talk with at different prisons is they all have a narrative. They all have a tra traumatic story. And it starts when it's about this girl's age. And, you know, yeah, she can look a little tough and a little like, yeah, I'm going to be good. And that's great. But, you know, what's really going on inside? And that trauma stays with you for life. I have it within me. And so, you know, I've got to work with that PTSD. We didn't even know what those things were back then. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's a large section of, uh, of the community that doesn't really go to therapy, right? We don't go to therapists. So how do you deal with a mother who's probably holding on, maybe an addict, maybe just poor, and just, you know, where there's not enough work for her or and trying to juggle her children. So there's just a lot of layers to this photograph for me. And, and you know, I mean, I can go on and really talk about it. not invent stories, just real stories. And, um, you know, I, I would never want my daughter to have to go through or my daughters to go through what this little girl is going through, right? And, you know, hopefully she's fine, you know, and hopefully the family came together. And I'm following family. See, I don't, I mean, one thing that for the record here, for the audience, I do everything slow. I started photographing in Walden House in 2008 with my own money. And that was, you know, $10,000 here, $10,000 there. But I, it's not about money. It's about how I think it's important to try to put this, put this work out there and really just let people know and see what happens to families? And, and many of these, you know, like Darlene Escalante, we're still close. I met her in 2008. She's just like, you know, lost her grandmother and she's in the series as well. And, you know, she was trying to get her kids back. She got her kids back. She's in 12 steps. She's doing good. She's got a job. And it's like totally different person who was an addict and a gang member when I met her. 
right? Jesse, has, uh, I have a man, his name is Jesse De La Cruz. If you go to my website, there's videos there and you could see some of the multimedia that I've done. All right, well, Jesse De La Cruz did 26 years in prison, ex heroin addict, lost his daughter to the streets. He comes out, he goes to uh, Stanislaus University, gets his, his EDD, he is now a court appointed gang consultant, taking care of his three grandchildren at the age of 68 years old with polio, not on drugs, not on alcohol. The kids are doing fine. I just talked to them this morning. I mean, those are the stories that I care about. I photographed many, many, many people on the, the sort of bottoms of their life, but always searching. Even, even, even East Side Stories, Gang Life in East LA, I've gone back after the 90s and 20, 25 years later, it's important, I think, if I'm going to talk about someone's life and they are at the bottom of their life, the way I was once was, I know that there's hope there for everyone. I really appreciate hearing from you about how photography has been a tool for, um, uh, you're remaking your life, but also sustaining these relationships uh, to, to, um, to, to build with people on an individual level, but also contributing these perspectives uh, more broadly. I'm really grateful that you've explained, like I said earlier, um, your own personal experience. And I think that um, now that I'm hearing from you, I, I see sort of how that comes into play in your work. Um, and how that direct the, the photos that you take are you know directly informed by things that you've experienced and that family members have experienced. Um, so I am grateful for that explanation. I'm really interested in the work that you've been doing, Vanessa, and it's obviously directly related related to the independent research that I'm conducting that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I've been interested in learning about what works and what doesn't in terms of providing services for those who are involved in the criminal legal system and also the specific kinds of support that is needed for people who are directly involved or have a family member that is involved within the criminal legal system and specifically how gender comes into play. Um, and so with all that in mind, my question was, in what areas do you see the girls you work with needing the most support and in what ways do you address them? I think that their mental health is huge um, at the moment. And um, I don't, to be honest, when we first um, co-founded Sisters Unchained, I don't think we realized that. You know, we were really, um, you know, when you're when you're doing the work, you you just do, do, do. And um, we were picking up the pieces and um, trying to reach as many girls as we could. And somehow, I think in year two, maybe almost three, we realized um, that when the girls showed up to, um, at that moment, we were only a summer program. So when they showed up, they would just automatic, as soon as they came in, they would just like dump everything that happened. And so much had happened than from the night before, <laughs> like someone got shot, their families got into an argument, someone got kicked out, there was violence and all these things happened in the, like between like 3 p.m. and 8 a.m. when we started, 8.30 a.m. And we realized that that was, what was needed a lot, what we, what we really needed for the program. Ideally, at some point, um, I would love to have an in-house therapist or an in-house social worker, because I do think it's needed. I think there's only so much space holding we can do. Um, and clearly that prisons are going to continue to exist and this problem is going to continue to exist. And um, that is, I think, one of the, the biggest the biggest needs is and healing and um, but mental health issues across the board from very small to very large. Um, it's that that's been like one of the um, the things that we've needed the most, um, and that comes in different areas. You know that could be as far um, as like just helping them find a therapist that's not um, through Mass Health um, or that is just a student that comes and goes because that's usually what you get when you're on Mass Health. Um, you get a, you don't get someone that sticks around for a long time. You get a student, you know, or an intern who's there for their semester to do their work and then they move on and then you have to open up the wounds again and tell them the whole story all over again, right? So that's been a huge challenge for us. Um, keeping clearly keeping that um, connection going has also been a challenge. Um, some of, sometimes some of, a lot of their parents aren't in Massachusetts anymore. And how do you get money to visit your parent if they are far off, you know, any, even just as 
like Framingham, if you're in Boston, the commuter rail is expensive to an average um, a student, you know, someone who's um, doesn't have enough money to eat. So things like that have been really challenging for us. And that's why we created the rides to try to help a little bit um, where we could. Um, there's also, I think I mentioned this before in another container with you, there's um, the need just to help with applications <laughs> and just basic things like that. I need a job. Can you help me do a resume? Or I, you know, I'm trying to get into school and um, how do you fill out this application? And you know, so that's also um, shoes we filled um, through the years um, with driving them to school, taking them, helping them with their college essays, moving them in, <laughs> helping them dorm shop, <laughs> you know, raising money to get them just like, because it's so exciting. You know, I, I, you know, if you have a child that's going to school, I mean, I was fortunate enough that when my son went to um, college that I was able to do that, but they don't have that, you know, so there's um, so many areas that they need um, help with. And then some, most of our girls have gone to college. Some of them haven't. College is not for everybody. Um, and then finding a job to be able to find a place to live so they're not in different, um, different friends' couches because sometimes at home is not, they just can't stay for whatever reason. If they've lost their parent or they're staying with an uncle or an aunt, it becomes toxic, you know, um, and then they're moving around. Um, we've also had issues with that. Um, we've been able to pay for a few hotels here and there for um, some of our youth that have aged out because you, you know, when, when the program's over, we say at um, the summer program, you only till 18, but they're still with us, you know, after um, attending whatever workshops or whatever here and there. And, you know, if they're, they can't stay at home anymore, you know, we were trying to provide assistance and help them get back on their feet or taking them to um, appointments so they can um, sign up for food stamps. So, I mean, it's hard for me to just say one or two things. <laughs> Um, in regards to like our volunteers, um, you know, to be honest, we've been very selective. Um, in the past, we've had um, people that are working on different students or um, even photographers, but not with the intentions that you have, Joseph, <laughs> with, with different. And I'm always very, I'm very weary about who we let into our circle because we, it's like I said, they, they just come in and they're like, oh my, let me tell you what happened. And all this stuff comes out. So we're, um, we're very mindful of who we let into our, our small sacred space. Um, and we want to make sure that they're not being exploited or they're not being, you know, they're not just you know, their story's not just being used for like your, your paper or your thesis, and then that's a wrap, right? Um, that's not something that we, we do um, or we encourage. So. Can I ask how many women you, you're, you are in your program right now? There are, um, so I'm going to say about 15-ish, give or take. Um, the summer, last year, because of COVID, we had a bunch of new girls, but we could only take in eight because of the space we were using and it was a hybrid program. But once you're in the pro, they always come back. You know, we have um, workshops that we offer. We, we actually just partnered up with a new, brand new re-entry program. So I was very excited to hear about this other re-entry program that you were talking about. They're brand new. They're just gonna open their doors like within the next couple of weeks if the fire department approves everything. <laughs> and that's gonna be a brand new experience for us. So um, we are going to have, um, our girls are going to do programming there um, at the reentry program and in hopes to have um, a form of um, intergenerational healing. And we hope that that continues. So that's brand new for us. Right now we're doing um, just Zoom programming with them. So that's at the moment, but you know, it's it, that that changes all the time. And we have another group of um, young girls that are not part of the summer program, but we just do um, offer rides. Very important work. Really, we need a lot more, a lot more out here. But I, 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 I just, yeah, I just honor what you do. And whew, this, you know, the reason why I, I sound like that is just simply because <laughs> it's, it's going to be four, four decades of like, of, of stories. And, you know, all these people you meet as you both work with, Folks, you know, their stories and their people and their lives and women are gonna come back to you and then they're gonna have their children and they're gonna have grandkids. And, and then if you see the positive shifts, it's just, that's what the work is about. That's, that's, that's all, it's, it's all it's about. I remember when I first became a, a photojournalist, 
And, you know, I walk into the New York Times and I said, and, you know, it was during the crack era and the AIDS era, and they always wanted you to photograph the darkest moments because who I am and where I come from. And you get stuck that way. And I said, you know, you folks are missing something here. You don't understand where this all really kind of starts. You got to focus on the mother and you got to focus on the family. And if you do not help, not that the journalism organization or the media outlet can do this, but letting the stories out to the world, I think, and let them folks know how important the mom is and the family is, because it all starts right there. Every child, that child behind the door, your children, my children, all of them, they all start in a very sweet, good place. <laughs> they, didn't ask, they didn't ask for all this drama to come. So, and, and if you can't take care of making, giving us, given the, you know, especially single moms, my mom was a single mom, oh my goodness. You know, there's no stability. Oof. I mean, what, what we have today is a lot more than what we had when I was a kid. So um, I, I just think that we gotta keep on keeping on and keep this fight alive because, you know, we don't fix the family. We, it's all about family. If you wanna see a little more, just go to my website. You can see the videos there and you can hear Darlene talk about her story. You can hear about these women talk about how they're, they're trying to get to where we all are right now. Yeah. And, uh, and the men as well. And, and uh, yeah, so I use my platform the best I can to try to get the work out. So, hmm? And thanks so much for sharing uh, to, to each of you uh, for uh, contributing today. Uh, I'm really grateful to hear Absolutely. more of your perspectives and especially to learn more about your work, Joseph, uh, and, and yours as well, Vanessa. And I encourage everyone watching to visit the Davis to see this important exhibition, Prison Nation, in addition to going to Joseph's website. Thanks to each of you. God bless you all. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.